There's nothing like black music. It's just something about it, right? The rhythms, the texture, the very sound of it makes you tap your foot, snap your fingers, or clap your hands. Despite whatever hardships you might be facing in that moment, black music has the power to activate that feeling deep in your soul in a way that no other music can. Yeah, there's nothing like black music or the exploitation of it. I'm Jay from Push Black, and you're listening to Black History Year. The cultural contributions of black folks are endless, let's be honest, especially when we're talking about music. Gospel, the blues, jazz, rock and roll, country, hip hop, So many styles can be traced back to us. And you already know the world just gobbles it up. Consume so much of it that when the recording industry hears black music, all they see is dollar signs. It's a price black artists have paid since the recording era's inception. The roots of this commodification and exploitation are a subject that today's guest knows very well. Fumi Ariwa, is a professor of transactional and business law at Temple University. Much of her research centers technology in Africa, but since becoming a law professor, it shifted to black music. She explores the business and legal structures in which music was created, a lot of which you can find in her upcoming book, Creation, Curation, and Culture, Law and Global Markets for Black Music. In the system of white supremacy, you'll find black folks exploited all around, no matter the industry, but especially when it comes to entertainment. Look at George and Willie Muse, two brothers who, in 1899, were abducted by a circus. Summer heat bore down on the performers as they prepared for their next big show. Clowns paraded around, contortionists stretched their frames, and two boys took their position. Today, they would be sheep-headed cannibals, and they did so without question. These were the Muse brothers. They'd already forgotten body autonomy, so it didn't matter to them what the owner had them do. If he wanted their hair in locks, so be it. And if he wanted them to dress like savages, they immediately did as they were told. George and Willie had become items, commodities for the circus. Kidnapped at such a young age, they didn't know another life outside of being sideshow attractions. The brothers were albinos. It was their white skin contrasting their black features that made them an oddity in the eyes of a white audience. And so the two were abducted from their mother, Harriet. While working in the tobacco fields, Robert Stokes found them. He worked for a circus, and he felt they had the potential to be lucrative. Stokes allegedly used candy to lure the boys to a carriage. And from then on, their worlds changed forever. Every day, George and Willie performed. Their bodies, their lives, their identity depended on whoever owned them. Now, Harriet had never stopped looking for her children. She moved to Roanoke, Virginia in search of better opportunities. And it's said that there she had a dream, a dream of her sons coming to the town as circus performers. She was right, and she vowed she would not miss the performance to reunite with her sons. Long before, the brothers were told that their mother was dead. Something in them whispered it wasn't true. But after so much time had passed, That voice vanished, and they stopped looking for her face in the crowd. On this particular tour, the brothers were marketed as aliens from Mars. When they had landed on their stop in Roanoke, they did not expect this day to be different from any other. What a delight it must have been when the Muse brothers saw Harriet in the front row of their performance. They recognized her at once, reunited at last, However, the reunion was short and bittersweet. 
The circus manager told the brothers that they belonged to him and that Harriet couldn't take them away. The Muse brothers. They were his things, his commodities, his money makers. And not much has changed since then. Entertainers are still seen as nothing more than possessions, commodities, as mere money makers for exploitative predators preying on the innovation and creativity of Black entertainers. Umi, what does Black liberation look like to you? I think for me, a lot of my research focuses on things related to economic rights. For me, liberation looks like people having the freedom to be able to have access to opportunities that other people in this in our general society have. Um, I think one of the things I talk about in my work is that in the United States today, for many people, there's a scarcity of opportunity in that opportunities relating to education, relating to housing, access to healthcare are not readily available to everyone. To me, from an economic perspective, liberation looks like having the same opportunities that other people in society have that's not diminished because of race, because of, of being Black. And I think for we've had a long period of African-American people having lack of access to opportunities. And it always becomes highlighted, you know, so the George Floyd murder highlights lack of access to equality in the civil and criminal justice system. Coronavirus highlights lack of access to equal opportunity in healthcare, access to vaccines, access to healthcare resources, access to jobs that are, are of the kind that can make you less vulnerable to coronavirus because you can work at home, for instance. When we look at things like coronavirus statistics, when we look at things like the racial wealth, wealth gap, to me, those are things that we need to target and thinking about what Black liberation looks like. That's not the only things we need to target. I'm just saying my research tends to focus on the economic right side of things, which is not, certainly, I'm not saying it's the most important or the only thing. How does your work contribute to that vision of Black liberation that you have? I see my work as almost an excavation mission. It's important to have a broader understanding of how the lack of opportunity shapes outcomes. I think sometimes we, we tend to have powerful assumptions about how our society works that may not actually reflect the reality. So I think it's important to bring data to the table that says, well, this is actually the experience of people. And this experience may not square with our common understandings or commonplace general understandings of what our society looks like. One key theme in the African-American experience in the United States has been marginalization. Marginalization in terms of economic opportunities, marginalization in terms of access to political rights. We're now playing out in the United States yet again, conscious efforts to deprive Black people of the right to vote. And this has been a longstanding struggle going on more than a century, but it's, it's remarkable how these same kind of patterns rear their head. So I think it's important to disclose how current patterns of marginalization have deep historical roots and disclose how marginalization may change and may vary, but you still see some of the same underlying patterns of marginalization. So one of the things I talk about in my, my research generally is how with African-Americans in the entertainment sphere, we see patterns of double marginalization. So I think almost everyone in entertainment, regardless of their race, specifically with the recording industry, many people complain about expo exploitation. And this is a longstanding pattern that actually goes back to the early days of the recording industry and in that a lot of performers have been exploited and have felt like they don't have sufficient power in relation to recording companies. And as a result, we can see someone like Taylor Swift, who's one of the most successful artists in music history, saying, you know, I have big problems with my recording company because of the contract I entered into when I was a very early, in the early stage in my career, I have limited ability to get what I think I should be getting out of my recording contracts. And so she has, she's very powerful relatively, and she has the ability to now, she's re-recording her a lot of her early records. And they, there's a long sort of legal reason she's doing that, but she's basically doing that so she can actually get a bigger share of the revenues from licensing of her records. And she's able to do that. 
with many African American um, musicians and entertainers and performers and creators, what we see are patterns of double exploitation because they encounter the same kinds of exploitation that other artists might complain about. But there's also been persistent patterns of exploitation based on race. And we see it play out in different ways during different time periods. So that's a kind of double exploitation that um, African-American artists experience that reflects general patterns of exploitation that others may experience, but then another type of exploitation that comes out of conceptions about race. Can you give us some examples? What did that look like from the earliest evidence you have in your research? Well, I think we can just start with the dawn of the recording industry. So one of the things I'm fascinated by is some of the technologies of early recording. So in the early recording industry, there was a search for finding things to record. And if you hear early recordings, like they're very noisy and that, that comes from a lot of different reasons. But one thing we know is that in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a search for things to record. Um, traditionally, culture in the U.S. came from Europe. The thing that's interesting about this search is that as African-Americans were freed from slavery, African-American music spread with African-American people in the United States. So after the end of slavery, there were a lot of folklorists that were out there collecting spirituals, for instance. And the thing that's interesting, when you hear the earliest slave songs in the United States, which was a folklore collection of spirituals that occurred in the 1860s, when you hear them talk about the music they were collecting, it makes you realize that the music was something they hadn't really heard before. Because that one of the things they talk about in, in the slave songs volume is that this sound that we're hearing, we don't really know how to write it down. And I think what that refers to is timbre and the, how, the, how the, the sound color, the sound texture of the music. So I think they were referring to something that has come out of the African-American tr tradition that they hadn't heard before. And I think in the 100 years since that, 100 actually at this point, 150 years since that almost, that sound of African-American influenced music has become a norm in popular music. So it has not, it's not so alien to people's ears. So from the earliest days of the recording industry, African-American music was being recorded and, and actually black people were actually recording music. Within that context, there were still a lot of exploitation and that if we think about some distinctively African-American musical forms like blues, the first people to record blues recordings were not African-American. African-Americans often didn't have the same kind of opportunities. It wasn't until um, Mamie Smith, there was recognition that there is a potential market. And this is a bit later. This is, you know, in the 1920s, there was recognition that there's a market for African-American music. And recording scouts went around and actually collected what we now refer to as early roots music, which was rural music. So in this search for content and things to record, the recording industry scouts and executives ran into rural music, things that we now refer to as, as we now think of as early blues. And they also ran into um, what they used to call at the time hillbilly music, which was country music, which, which sort of has become country music. The thing that's interesting is that there was a, at the time, the, in the early recording industry, a significant portion of what they referred to as the hillbilly bands were Black. And we, we can think of them as Black string bands. And I think the Carolina Chocolate Drops and the Ebony, Ebony Hillbillies today have brought attention to this early history of music interaction. So if you were a Black string band in the 1920s, it was very hard for you to get recorded. Because one of the first things the music industry did was they decided to segregate music by race. So they they thought about authentic black music as being blues and authentic white music was hillbilly music. So if you were a black string band, you weren't necessarily singing blues. So you weren't singing the thing that they thought was authentically black. How did that change to mean, you know, if you're black, you're doing blues. And if you're white, you're doing hillbilly music. I think it was just the organizing assumptions of the recording industry. In my book, which is coming out next year, which is called Creation, Curation, and Culture, Law and Global Markets for Black Music. Um, one of the things I, I do in that book is I trace out this history a bit. I think part of what we were seeing, if we look at the era of early folklorists, we look at the recording industry era, people are doing what I refer to as curation. They're making a determination as what they see as authentic Black culture. And prior to sort of the civil rights era, the mid part of the 20th century, these decisions were made by generally white intermediaries. They would decide that this is what I think is authentic Black culture. They would go and collect it, and they would represent it as such. 
So part of going back to your question about Black liberation, part of liberation is the ability and autonomy to make decisions about your own culture. We've seen persistently in the history of music, these kinds of external intermediaries playing a big role in making determinations about, well, what is authentic Black music? And I think in by the time of the recording era, there was an assumption that authentic Black music is blues. So that left a huge number of people that were actually doing other kinds of music because we know from the earliest days on plantations, for instance, African-American musicians could do classical music. They did things that we think about as authentically Black music. And they did things that are now categorized as white. So country music has become categorized as white music to a significant extent. Now we're seeing pushback against that today, but it was a long time coming because country music comes out of mixed race music. It comes out of the fact that we know there was a lot of musical interchange in the 19th century into the 20th century. For instance, the banjo is an African instrument. Thomas Jefferson talked about it in, in Notes on the State of Virginia. We know it comes out of the African tradition and was modified and adapted and used by slaves. We know the fiddle comes from Northern Europe. Now, by the end of the 19th century, the banjo had, to a significant degree, had become used in white musical cultures. And we know a significant portion of the fiddle repertoire, the Southern fiddle repertoire, comes out of the African-American tradition. So we know there was cross-racial musical interchange because a lot of the traditions overlapped. We had Black string bands. And a lot of the string band, uh, again, the fiddle tradition comes out of the African-American tradition. So within this context of flow of culture that crossed races, we know that the recording industry made some decisions that shaped the creation that, as it actually existed, because the Black string band tradition came close to dying out because Black string bands couldn't get recorded. If you wanted to get recorded, if you were Black, you had to play blues. Now, the same wasn't so true for white musicians. White musicians could record blues and jazz. So it, it just highlights that I think the patterns of exploitation were not experienced the same by, by African-Americans in many contexts. There was another level of exploitation that was at play. So when you say they, if they were Black, they couldn't record a certain type of music. Was that because if black folks were involved, they could be, you know, doing it better than white folks, taking money away from the white folks who were doing it? Or what, what were there other reasons there? Um, that's a, that's an interesting question. It, it wasn't, I think Rhiannon Giddens of the Carolina Chocolate Drops has, has talked about this a bit. It wasn't that no string bands were recorded. It's just that the, whatever was recorded didn't represent what was there on the ground. There's suggestions that as many, that significant portion, we're talking 30 to 50% of string bands in the South in the pre-recording era were African-American, were Black string bands. I think it, it does touch on racial assumptions. People didn't necessarily say, I, I'm afraid of African-Americans entering this market. There was generally an assumption that blues was a kind of creative production that was for Black markets. It was for Black people. So it was produced by Black people for Black people. So the early blues recordings, when blues was popular music, you know, in the 1920s, those recordings were produced for a market that was carved out as being a market of Black consumers. Now, even though we know there was interracial musical, musical exchange before, this was the same time period where people were building monuments to the Confederacy. And we know that there was a resurgence of sort of uh, oppression of Black people during this time period. So it might have well have been just part of this broader racial environment, uh, a, an attempt to rewrite history and rewrite the place of African-Americans in terms of uh, what kind of rights they might have. Um, again, this is a construction of monuments. We have um, significant legal efforts to really diminish political rights for African-Americans. So this was a, a time period of significant racial oppression in the United States. So it, it, music was part of that. I'm not sure people wrote exactly why they were doing that, but I think it was it, it really came out of these kinds of broader racial assumptions and the broader racial climate of the times, which was very, a very violent time. So there was assumptions made around the existence of markets for the type of music and the assumptions were probably Black folks will support this type of music from Black folks and white folks support this type of music from white folks. Yeah, or or that they, they, they were just natural markets. There's an idea that this was Black culture. Again, this is part of the curation part where people are sort of determining what constitutes authentic Black culture. That makes me think of this 
the genre of gangster rap that emerged decades ago. And I think that's now synonymous with Black music and Black culture. But I'm skeptical as to whether or not Black folks decided that or if, you know, the white folks who run the industry decided that. Do you have any research or thoughts on that? Well, I think you're just highlighting the fact that what we're talking about is marketing categories. Early blues music was all part of a marketing category that was created by executives and scouts, the vast majority of whom were white, that determined what authentic Black culture was. And they had the ability, as they were intermediaries, they had the power to shape broader conceptions of what Black culture was. You, we saw it with the folklorist um, John Lomax, who discovered, and I use that in quotations, right, Huddy Ledbetter, also known as Leadbelly. His son was uh, connected to the discovery of Muddy Waters in trips to Mississippi in the 1940s. They decided what they were going to collect and what they were going to think about as being Black music. In my book, I talk a little bit about John Lomax and Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston, who was you know, trained as an anthropologist, had a view of, of Black culture as being living, as being changing. So there's a letter to Langston Hughes that she quotes where she talks about there's all this new stuff out there that's coming out. Um, if you contrast her views of culture with John Lomax, John Lomax had a view of culture where he was looking for some kind of vision of what he thought Black culture should be, and he wanted to collect it before it went away. He didn't see the change in the same way that she did, but he he had a lot of power because he was connected to the uh, Federal Writers Project. He was connected to the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress. He, has a lot, he had a lot of power to define what was considered to be Black culture for the, for the purpose of important collections, important collections of culture. So I think you're absolutely right that it, from a, the recording industry, it was really about marketing, but that therefore went and shaped culture. Because going back to the story of Black string bands, Black string bands almost died out. When the Carolina Chocolate Drops, uh, Rhiannon Giddens, who was one of the founding members of the Carolina Chocolate Drops, when they got started, they actually that went and found a fiddler who'd been, who'd lived a long time. He died um, not too long ago when he was in his 90s. He was a he was black fiddler. And he was one of the few remaining black fiddlers in that tradition because where would they go? There wasn't really space for them in the cultural categories that had been created. So part of what we're talking about is about the continuing creation of cultural categories that define what black culture is, often by people who are coming from the outside and who have a lot of power to, to define what Black culture is. And that seems to me to be quite anti-Black liberation in my definition, uh, which relates strongly to self-determination. So it seems that we have a group of other folks who are controlling and defining what our culture is, which doesn't just impact you know, the artist and their ability to make a living, but think there's evidence that it impacts how we see ourselves and what we should value in our place in the world by only looking to the categories we're told to look to. Yes. And I think we see it on a continuing basis. So one of the more interesting stories is if you look at the story of Old Town Road, it's sort of country rap hybrid that was removed from the country music charts. In the 19, early 1920s, when we had the creation of music markets targeted at Black people from a marketing perspective. They called it race records, right? And, and because that was targeted at Black people. Now, the name race records in the 1940s was changed to R&B, but that was still defined as a Black genre. And today, for instance, if we look at the Grammys, if we look at record label organizational, um, how they organize labels, there's they call the category today urban. Right. There's a Grammy category for urban, which ironically, I think last year, the Black Music Action Coalition is something that arose in response to Black Lives Matter, um, particularly following the murder of George Floyd. And one of the things they focused on is it's not just defining the culture as Black. It's also that we see persistent patterns of exploitation, of economic exploitation targeted at that category that's defined as Black. It's, again, not to say that Black artists are the only artists that are exploited. It's just to say there's an extra level of exploitation that occurs on top of other levels of exploitation that is racially motivated and targeted. So you see, and part of that is recording charts. So Lil Nas X can't be on the country charts because, and there's been a long historical tension about race and country music. We see it now with Mickey Guyton, who is a big star now in country, but she, she, she told she tells a story when you know she 
when she goes to meet people or when she sings, she was singing somewhere. I think it was a soundtrack for a movie and she was singing and people were like, you should be singing R&B. So she's constantly run into this issue of people telling her she's a country music singer and people telling her, well, you, you should be an R&B singer. And that's entirely racial. And this is in the, this is in the current era. So these categories have not gone away. We, they, we just renamed them to a significant degree and it still continues to shape what people can perform. Because if I'm an African-American musician and I want to sing country music, it's much harder than if I were white, because there's a, an assumption that that's not a, a genre that Black people sing. Pop and rock are also considered genres that are white genres to a significant degree. African-Americans, Black people are still categorized into segregated parts of the market. It's not as bad as the days of Pat Boone, where we had this early race records category that was early blues music. By the time we get to the R&B rock and roll era, we have systematic use of cover recordings. So Little Richard would do a song, but he was marketed in the black charts. Pat Boone would then do a cover recording of his song and he was allowed access to the mainstream markets. And so the patterns of exploitation based on race have changed over time or morphed over time, but they're still present. And we see systematic patterns of exploitation going from claiming copyright rights to uh, lower royalty compensation rates. So stated royalty rates are often lower. We know in the early, in the R&B era, we have a series of cases where it's pretty clear that African-American R&B performers were getting maybe 40 to 60% of the stated royalty rates that white performers were getting. When you say copyrights and royalties, can you give us a general idea of what this is and how it works? So copyright is something that basically gives creators or, or, or other people rights, exclusive rights to do things like copy, to distribute. How it plays out in music is if I create a musical work that's copyrightable, that work, I can exclude other people from doing certain things with respect to that work. And I have the exclusive right to copy it. I have the exclusive right to perform it. And I have the exclusive right to distribute recordings of it. So I can keep other people from copying my music without compensating me. And when we talk about the recording industry, music publishing, it's about how those rights get assigned and transferred and who gets compensated for what rights. How people get compensated, people tend to get compensated with, with something called royalties. And a royalty is just basically a percentage that you get. In the simplest case in music, let's think about a record. If I sing my music and then I distribute it myself, I don't have to worry about royalties. But the way it typically happens is if I'm a composer and a, and a performer and I sing, I typically would have a music publishing agreement with a music publisher for, the, for my comp compositions. And then I typically would have a separate arrangement with my recording company. On the recording side, typically the person who's singing the song may not have any rights because the record is a performance of that underlying written composition. So if I'm just a performer recording it, copyright doesn't see me as a creator. Copyright sees me as someone that's performing someone else's creation. So someone, so um, I think like Dolly Parton, for instance, is the composer of I'll Always Love You, which is really we know that uh, that song became very, very famous because Whitney Houston had such a remarkable rendition of the song that just, I think, was just a fabulous, I mean, fabulous voice, fabulous singer. Typically, the royalty rates are, are, are just sort of, they often aren't individually negotiated, but it's very easy to do a cover recording. Once someone else has released a record, it's very easy to do a cover recording of that composition. Um, and there's typically that composer will get paid compensation. But I, as the person recording that song, Typically what will happen is any, any copyright interest I might have is assigned to the recording company. And that's when people talk about masters, they're basically talking about copyrights in the sound recording. And so that means that I have to come up with a way to get paid for my recording and royalties are the way we typically get paid. And then even if royalties are paid, so stated royalty rates are often lower. We know in the early, in the R&B era, we have a series of cases where it's pretty clear that African-American R&B performers were getting maybe 40 to 60 percent of the stated royalty rates that white performers were getting. Connect those dots for us in terms of how Black musicians, Black artists, recording artists, 
have been excluded from benefiting from the royalties that they should be getting? It was very common in the early days for people to um, sell any copyright uh, they were entitled to for a flat fee, to often to recording industry scouts and recording, recording industry executives. In the case of John Lomax, who was a folklorist, he went around to prisons in the Southern United States and collected from prisoners who were brought to him in chains. And he immediately had Lead Belly sign a copyright assignment to him um, where Lead Belly agreed, or Huddy Ledbetter agreed to pay John Lomax two thirds of any proceeds from the sales of his creations. And so that, that kind of arrangement was common. Were they coerced? Were they just misinformed? What was, um, what was leading to this? Well, I think we ha- they had a different view of culture in those days. We now recognize today that culture has very long legs in terms of economic viability for, for certain creators. We know that. I think at the time, there, w- there wasn't any thought to someone listening to a recording 30 years later. There was only a thought as to the immediate market for that record. So we, we know that people thought of this kind of these kinds of recordings as, be, as being ephemeral because they destroyed a lot of them during World War II. Um, during World War II, a lot of masters were just destroyed, sometimes for their um, base materials. And sometimes people just didn't th- think of them as having value. And I think there was also an, an innate assumption that somehow African-American people or Black people weren't entitled to this. I think John Lomax felt perfectly entitled to claim copyrights. And there's a long-standing history of dispute between him and Leadbelly about the royalties, and, and John Lomax didn't pay them. And so there, Leadbelly actually attempted to get a lawyer. But you can imagine, this is we're talking about the 1920s, 30s, 40s. It was very difficult for an African-American to enforce a contr- contractual obligation against someone white. Um, in many parts of the United States, probably all parts of the United States. Think about appearing before a judge or a jury. And my conversation with people that lived um, during this era, it, to them, it was probably pretty inconceivable for the most part in the early part of this era that you could actually sue someone white in a court, in a third party contract dispute and have any kind of remedy. This is a period where there was pervasive violence directed against African-Americans. So I think the remedies were, were, were probably very challenging in this era. So it's clear that, you know, the wealth of this entire country was built on the backs of Black folks. Is there evidence to show that, you know, the production that Black folks created but didn't benefit from is a significant foundation for the trillion-dollar music recording industry that we we know today? I think Black music is a core part of popular music, and it's a core part of what made American culture, uh, uh, the American cultural industry is a global behemoth in music because a lot of that music that was the creativity, the innovation, a lot of that was coming out of the African American tradition. So absolutely, yes, that's the case. If you and you think about, it, and I, I, I first realized this when I started to talk to people early in my research, started to talk to people after the war in Europe about their experiences of American music, and to a significant degree. The music that people found engaging, that people were listening to, was African-American music, whether performed by African-American musicians or not. If you look at the response to to Louis Armstrong throughout Europe, for instance, um, and you you talk, you know, I went to Prague and talked to people about Louis Armstrong coming to Prague and how important a cultural event that was. I went to archives and looked at in the former uh, archives of the former East Germany and looked at files of prominent African-American musicians, sort of the, the media files that showed what news stories were st- saying about them. And it's, it's the impact of African-American culture is, is profound. A global impact of African-American culture is profound. And we see it in Europe. We see it in Japan. We see it in South Korea. We see it in the Philippines. It spread with the U.S. military. And it went, we see successive genres of music, jazz, for instance, we see R&B that have had a huge global influence. And a lot of that comes out of the African-American cultural tradition. And I think many, uh, in many respects, there hasn't been adequate credit given and there hasn't been adequate compensation given to some of the sources of that music. Now, that's obviously changed a bit today. I think things are better today in some respects, but it's amazing how pervasive and enduring and sustainable some of these patterns are. I think when the majority of folks, you know, think of recording artists, I think we're thinking celebrities, you know, diamonds, mansions, cars, 
what does this mean for us as a community that, you know, things may not be what they seem to be or what they could be for Black folks in the recording industry? How else can we be thinking about this as an issue of concern in the community? I think it's a big issue of concern because the African-American contribution to music, to popular music, is profound and pervasive. That contribution needs to be credited properly. That contribution needs to receive proper compensation. And I think the racial wealth gap comes to play because a lot of times people aren't getting what they're entitled to when they're alive. And it becomes even more problematic when people die because you have heirs that may not actually know what's actually out there and what the contracts are. It, it, it becomes all of the stories, the common the common thread in a lot of these stories about heirs, Johnny Taylor's heirs, um, Muddy Waters' heirs, are that it's very di- it becomes very difficult to sort out these royalty arrangements. One of the things we're researching now is we're taking a closer look at some of the cases um, and actually the legal documents involved in some of these cases to try to sort out what lessons we can learn about them to understand what needs to be different in the future, but also understand how we can rectify the problems of the past. I think the first step is to have really robust disclosure. I think the BMG audit gets us part of the way there, but it doesn't get us all the way there. We need to have actual robust and significant disclosure about the inequities and the and the differential compensation that's been paid to, to Black artists. So I think we need to shine a spotlight on these past cases and show a path to having a different outcome in the future. But I think absolutely it's something that contributes to the racial wealth gap because we know that there's not the compensation that should be flowing to creators and their heirs. And you know, one thing I think about too is this aspect of culture, and you've mentioned that a number of times and how it it flows and music music shares values, it shares it passes down culture. And if black folks aren't in control of that, if we don't, if we aren't, you know, earning our m- money from the music we're making, able to put that into other artists or other, you know, independent labels or things like that, it seems that we're losing a big part of that control and how we're shaping the culture of our community. Yeah, absolutely. And this also highlights the fact that the music industry itself is uh, still not representative. There's some serious diversity, equity, and inclusion issues in the industry itself. There's very little diversity and inclusion, equity and inclusion in terms of the staffing and executives at multiple points in the music industry. It, recording industry, it, it can be recording industry executives, it can be touring. It doesn't matter which aspect you look at. There's not representation, certainly of African-Americans to the extent there should be, especially given the cultural contribution that we've seen of African-American culture and music. You know, we've mentioned how Worldwide, folks' interaction with American music for the longest was with Black created music. You know, why do you think it is that we're so powerful in this art form? That's a fantastic question. I've been grappling with this for a while. I think a lot of the power of African American music comes out of the African American experience, it comes out of the ability to sustain generations of oppression. It comes out of the ability to create something of beauty in an environment that is prof- has been profoundly hostile racially. It comes out of the innovative ability to actually become a dominant source of culture in a racial environment that's hostile. And I often think about the early performers in the late 19th and 20th century. You know, there are people that had to walk in the back door of places that where they were performing on stage for segregated audiences. So I think about the ability to sustain and endure and create something of beauty that I think came out of our experience of slavery and our experience of oppression and violence after slavery. It's a testament, I think, to the human spirit. It's a testament to endurance and the ability to to really manage circumstances that are just were unbelievable in their kind the the kind of violence that we saw when when some of the early music was being created. So I think we should see it as a celebration of the human spirit. 
and African-American culture. From my understanding, music has always been part of a Black life from, you know, when we were Africans, unhyphenated Africans, before we became African-Americans. You know, music was always a part of our life. And so it seems that, you know, in everything that we did, rituals or, you know, work or just going about our day, music was always there. So it seems that um, we probably had a head start, probably centuries of head starts in terms of how we interact with with music and rhythm that I think, you know, through our experience in America and the unique position we are here in America's wealth has been able to come through generations and, and reach the world. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think it's important to see this as a form of innovation. We often, I think, going back to our racial categorization, we often sort of will hear people say, well, they, they're just naturally talented. Right. That this is just something that, you you know, you, you it's nature. It's not sort of it's not something that's intentional. I think we have to think about the innovation that's required to navigate the kind of spaces we have had historically in the United States to navigate them and become successful performers and to become successful creators of genres of music that have inspired people all over the world that have translated that suffering into something that helped give solace to African-American people, but also help give inspiration to people all over the world. And I think that kind of innovation, I think it's really important to think about that in terms of the innovation involved and not think about it as in terms of racial categorizations that I think tend to diminish us as African-American people. But I think it, it is a part of our cultural heritage. just like that, we're at the end of this episode of Black History Year. This podcast is produced by Push Black, the nation's largest nonprofit black media company. At Push Black, we agree with Marcus Garvey when he said, a people without knowledge of their past, history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. And I'm guessing you probably feel that's important too. I mean, you're here at the end of a podcast about black history. You matter. Your choice to be here matters. It lets us know that you value the work. Push Black exists because we saw we had to take matters into our own hands. And you make Push Black happen with your contributions at blackhistoryyear.com. Most people do five or ten bucks a month, but every little bit makes a difference. I appreciate you supporting the work. The Black History Year production team includes Tarek Alani, Patrick Sanders, Leslie Taylor Grover, William Anderson, Jerea Bradley, Brooke Brown, Siobhan Chapman, Tabitha Jacobs, Abney Jones, Brianna Lambach, Courtney Morgan, Zane Murdoch, Aquia Tay, Tasha Taylor, and Darren Wallace. Producing the podcast, we have Sydney Smith and Sasha Kai Parker, who also edits the show. And Black History Year's executive producer is Julian Walker. And I'm Jay from Push Black. Peace.